We find that if we have sensitive parents who are working on sensitivity, theory of mind, they're forming secure attachments, the rate of placement out of the home really drops. Welcome to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a show about adoption, foster care, advocacy, and becoming the best caregiver possible. Pull up a chair. We're glad you've joined us. Here are your hosts, Mike and Kristen Berry. Friends, welcome back to the Honestly Adoption Podcast. Welcome to you if you're just now checking out the show. We're glad you're here. You're joining us for Season 29, Episode 270, and we have a special treat in this episode. We're replaying a session that we did with our good friend, Deborah Gray, from Insight Virtual Conference 2021, where she talked about your children's needs and your responsibilities. So identifying the needs that your children have and then knowing and understanding what your responsibility is as a caregiver. And here's the thing. I'm play, we're playing this replay for you. We're sharing this replay with you, with you because in less than a week, Insight Virtual Conference 2023 kicks off. There's still time to get your tickets over at honestlyadoption.com slash insight. More than 15 hours of training content or continuing education credit if you are a professional and you get access to world-renowned leaders, speakers, and influencers in the foster care and adoption space. And here's the thing. A lot of people that have signed up already are excited because there is just an amazing camaraderie and community that happens over these two days. It's all happening next week, April 20th and 21st. And each year that we've done this conference, when it's over, people are like, oh my gosh, that was amazing to connect with uh, with your team, with these speakers, ask these questions, and feel like I'm not alone. That's what Insight Conference is all about. Along with that, providing incredible insight and encouragement and inspiration to help you become the best caregiver possible. You're going to get a taste in this episode over, uh, you're going to get a taste of the awesome content that uh, we that's presented at Insight with Deborah Gray's session. Um, but guys, don't miss out on your chance to get a spot. Insight Virtual Conference 2023 kicks off in just a few days. You can grab your ticket now for the regular price. Of $49 if you are getting general access. It gives you six uh, months replay. Uh, $69 if you are a professional needing continuing education credit. And $89 if you want lifetime access to the content. That's right. We cap the access to the replays at six months unless you purchase lifetime access. So get those tickets now before it's too late because at the door prices are going up. Honestlyadoption.com slash insight. All right. Let's jump in to this amazing replay with our good friend Deborah Gray talking all about your children's needs and your responsibility. Deborah has a Lifetime Achievement Award uh, from 2015 from Attach and was a Henry Meyer practitioner in residence at the University of Washington. She treats children and families in a specialty practice focused on trauma, attachment, grief, and parenting support. She was core faculty for the Portland State University Foster Care and Adoption Therapy Program. She is the author of the Attachment Trauma Focused Therapy Program, now taught by Attach. Deborah authored Promoting Healthy Attachments, Attaching Through Love, Hugs and Play, Nurturing Adoptions, and Attaching in Adoption. She co-authored Games and Activities for Attaching with Your Child. And Deborah is one of my go-to answers for everything. When someone wants to know what to do, I say, I will loan you Deborah's book or get it off of Amazon. You're going to want these resources. So Deborah, I'm so happy to have you here today. Thank you so much for being here. We'll well, thank you so away. much for inviting me. Uh, first of all, one of the things I wanted to mention is that Early on, I noticed that if I had the wit to ask parents coming through what works for them the best, what made them successful, what didn't work very well, I could start to collect from my parents um, a repository or a fund of information that then I could pass on to other parents. 
So I'm going to talk to you today about some research, some of my experience, but most of what I'm going to talk to you about comes from the wealth of information that I have from other families who have been down this road ahead of you. We have just so much that we know that we didn't know 30 years ago, 20 years ago. You know, and I came from a family with a lot of adoption. We made a lot of mistakes. We just didn't know better. And now we just have so much more to support families. So I come as part of that next wave. Well, this works well, or try this. In preparing this talk, I thought that I would um, discuss a few things that maybe you hadn't heard before, and then some of the things that maybe are reminders of things that you do well and just need encouragement to do a little bit more. So slide two. So can you turn the slide, please? Thank you. So this talk will be organized to increase your insight. Number one, we're going to talk about priorities. What works? What research findings are really going to guide our parenting so that, you know, we take a look at the big picture? Um, I was part of a five year project. 40 of us, it was from practitioners around the country. Um, I was invited to be the representative on attachment. Um, but we looked at every single research study that's ever been done on foster care and adopted kids, what makes them do well. What was interesting is that 40 of us around the country were asked to be part of this project. All 40 of us said yes. And the funding was negligible. You know, with some little honorarium if you filled out these papers. But it was like, how can we all put our heads together and then contribute to the information that is um, coming forward to support families. Some of that research will be in my talk, and that gives me kind of the bounce or foundation for why we're doing certain things. Um, the number two, and this is just going through, this is how we're organizing the talk. We're going to talk about attachment, something called our HPA axis regulation to be defined, in executive functioning. And these concepts are going to provide you a, like, aha, now I understand insight. Many of you are getting books that are recommended by your pediatrician that are for kids who have started out with a strong foundation, physiologically, a strong foundation. Maybe the kids just have some behavioral kinks. Um, I'm going to talk about kids who have a different kind of foundation and what do we do about that? And then number three, everyday skills and tools. Some of that will just come through as part of the talk, but we're going to just go through a, a quick list of what are the basic things everybody has to pay a lot of attention to. So next slide. Executive functioning. Let's talk about that a little bit. I've been part of an ACE think tank. We've looked at this five-year project. And what we find is after high-stress beginnings, often after prenatal trauma, prenatal high-stress, uh, certainly after exposure to alcohol in utero, after exposure sometimes to opiates, sometimes not, and genetically, we find a lot of kids have what we call executive dysfunction rather than executive functioning. Let's define it in the positive way first. And by by the way, for those of you who are rapidly taking notes, um, it occurred to me that it would be really nice if I provided a glossary for you in common day language. And I've sent this on to Mike and Kristen so that they can post it on the website for you. I've also provided um, just a one-page sheet on 10 ways that you can work with highly stressed children or adults. Um, that is executive, you know, how to work with people who have trouble with executive functioning. And then I have five or six pages that go on and describe it in more depth. So those are available to you on your website, I think. 
Okay, so let's go on to uh, executive functioning. So working memory is part of it, especially auditory, processing, remembering what was told to you in real life situations. Another one, self-monitoring. What am I supposed to be doing right now? How is that influencing other people? A lot of times you're like, this kid is like in a bubble by themselves. Yeah, that's because they are not monitoring what they're supposed to be doing and how that's affecting the people around them. Or, you know, they kind of forget what they're supposed to be doing and wander off mentally in another direction and pretty soon the body follows. Number three, getting the main point or the big picture, not the details only. Inhibiting, stopping impulsive behavior. Um, let me go back to number three, getting the main point or the big picture, not the details only. Um, when you are in everyday day life, um, many times um, you're seeing Okay, this is the big idea, and this is how all the details fit in. And so you see the forest. You see that the tree is part of that forest. But for people with executive dysfunction, they tend to see tree, 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 tree. And at a certain point, they say, oh, could this be a forest? It's just a different way that your brain processes. Number four, inhibiting. Stopping impulsive behavior. And just to be able to stop ourselves from doing something means that we have to do something called inhibit. And, you know, in the beginning little video, there was a little girl, you know, I don't mean to do these bad things. And for many of you, you're like, why can't my kids seem to stop themselves, stay on track? And if you're thinking this, through with us, it's like, oh, maybe the problem here is they're having trouble with self-monitoring. They're having a problem with getting the main point. They're having a problem with inhibiting. Next slide. Um, slide number four. Thank you. Organizing. Being able to put things into categories or classifications. Many of you just automatically Go in and see how a room is organized. Or you put things in your memory based on large categories. This goes with this. Or, for example, with executive functioning, um, I'm numbering. Everything with executive functioning that I'm telling you goes through one through eight. It's an automatic classification. I don't do a slide set that has a slide on executive functioning where I put one and two and then a little later put three and four and a little later five and six. I think how do we put those in like categories? Many kids can't clean up their rooms because they can't see first you get the toys and then you get all the papers and then you get all the clothes and then you make the bed. Everything seems random. And so that's also a reason why it's really hard for kids to be able to remember uh, things because to put them into your working memory, it's much easier if you have classifications. Number six, being able to switch attention or keep paying attention when it takes an effort. We call this effortful attention. And the kids have a real tough time with that. Um, it's like when they're on, a, a video or a tablet and you ask them to move their attention very very tough or if they're working on something you say take a minute and go do this and then come back it's really hard for them to break away and come back or to stay on something when it takes an effort it's like this is so hard to do this homework it's really tough and it is tough and these are all brain-based. It isn't that the kid has some kind of a major discipline issue. Another one is sense of time. How long does it take to do something? Or yesterday, I did um, some sessions in office. I'm coming back and doing more sessions in office now. So I was talking to a little boy, and we have five more minutes, 
in our session. And he was working back and forth on a little Lego kit um, as his parents and I were talking with him. And then we did some work with him so we could kind of go back and forth from the Lego kit. He wanted to finish the Lego kit before he left, which he accomplished. With five minutes, he grabbed another one quickly and started to open it up. Now, a lot of people would be like, can't he see that the time's almost up? We told you, blah, 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 blah. But no, that isn't something that's occurring to him. Something we're going to have to build in for him is a sense of time. Now, he's doing better already. Have the parent give him a watch. And then I can gently say to him, you're doing so well in the neighborhood now. Taking time to know that, you know, it, it takes five minutes for you to walk home in the neighborhood. You know, we've got a reward system for when he gets home, when he's supposed to be on time. He's got beep first. He said, well, next time when I see you, maybe I could send a beeper to go off five minutes before the end of the session. Way to go. Notice how we're building executive functioning. We're helping him out. And the last one is circadian rhythm. That's when to sleep, wake, eat, be alert, be active. And what we find is instead of the curve for kids that's like, you know, you I'll give you the curve in the next slide, but instead of a curve that comes down where you're running lower cortisol by the end of the day and you're tired, they run an inverse curve, an opposite curve, and go the other direction. Now, some of you may be looking at this and say, I used to have good executive functioning and mine is down the drain now since I've been parenting high-stress kids. And as a matter of fact, many of us have problems with executive functioning when we're running high stress. Um, and Or some of you might be looking at this list and say, well, this kind of describes my spouse. Did he have a high-stress beginning? And some of this can be genetic. Some of us are stronger weaker in executive functioning. But what we find is executive functioning is something that normally develops in the early part of life. Around 25, we start to think really well. Some people it takes till 28. Early bloomers, late teens, they're coming along strong in executive functioning. But from our ACEs study, which is the adverse childhood event studies, the application of that, just goes through and lists all that kind of bad things or stressful things that can happen to kids. We find people with high ACEs, children, teens, and adults have a lot of trouble with executive functioning. The rates are quite high. And we find with kids in foster care, this is just across the board a problem. So a lot of our talk today will be, how do we parent such kids what moves the needle? What do we do about that? So next slide, number five. So this is a normal cortisol curve. And as you can see, you know, at, at 12 a.m., that's in the middle of the night. And cort oh, let me go back and define. Cortisol is um, something that your body produces that basically is produced you can see it with stress, and it's produced basically to tell the body, um, stop, you know, stop doing certain things. I, I, I don't want to go into the, it, the whole mechanism of it, but basically with just a really simple spit test, we can measure how much stress people are under. And what we find is with foster kids, we're seeing you know, high cortisol levels, if they've been under really, really high stress, after a while that drops low because they're so sensitized, their body only has to produce a little bit to get a stress reaction. And they're, they're like uh, war vets. They're just kind of fatigued. And we see this kind of low level. It doesn't mean that people aren't stressed, but it means that their bodies are just really worn out. But for our kids, you see this cortisol level, and this is a 24-hour period. And 
um, you can see that this is a normal cortisol level. At 12 a.m., it's at our lowest, and that lets people sleep. And then you see somewhere around 8, 9, when we're supposed to be getting up, cortisol levels are rising. Time to get up. And then see how, like, between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m., you know, it's still pretty high. Those are our big learning um, hours of the day where we're pretty productive. This is just a normal one for kids. What our kids have is an opposite one. It's inverse. And so the kids often are drowsy in the morning, hard to wake up. Their appetite isn't up yet in many cases. And then, you know, in their prime learning periods, they're not at really their best. Maybe they're, you know, really active and alert going up into the evening. However, many times they're not sleeping all that well. We find kids often just aren't, aren't having good sleep after they've had early trauma, early stress. They're kind of wired to be awake, watch out for themselves. And so this is describing why so many of the kids are having difficulties. This is making sense to some of you. And this is research I've been following since 1999, when our first research came in through the brilliant researcher, Megan Gunner, and she was describing these cortisol levels. Um, you know, Philip Fisher does a lot of work on this. Uh, the Oregon Social Learning Program has come up with a whole protocol for how we can change things up for kids who are foster and adoptive. Um, he's in his Mary Dozier, her team at the University of Delaware is working on this. Megan Gunner, University of Minnesota. I've referenced a lot of this in some of um, the work in my, my books. But today is kind of a, I don't want to get bogged down in the research. I've read it so you don't have to. But um, on slide six, just very simply, if we have kids and adults who have high stress, especially in the early years, we have impacts on their executive function, on executive function called executive dysfunction. And so now we're on slide seven. If you could move one more. So we find that the brain is shaped to survive in a less protected environment. In summary, kids are wakeful at night, drowsy in the morning, not hungry when they should be, they want food attention when you're trying to calm down at the end of the day. So the brain has been wired to react to an unpredictable, very high stress environment. None of this is conscious. Move to slide eight. And I've just laid out for you uh, someone else's very nice picture of what the stress response looks like. And you notice that this rest stress response picture has the pituitary gland, the hypothalamus, you know, and the adrenal gland. Slide nine moves you on and it shows where these things are in your body. And none of these areas are up in your thinking brain. So a lot of what we're doing, let's move on to slide 10, is a lot of what we're doing is working with systems that aren't part of our um, conscious, let's think about it and talk about it systems. We're going to work a system lower uh, for many of, of the kids. And I'll go on and explore this a little more in a few minutes. So let's talk, though, about what works for kids who have executive dysfunction. How do we work with kids? Because we know that what doesn't work so well is we keep on saying, why don't you think before you do this? Well, if we look back and see some of the slides before, the part of the brain that thinks, which is our neocortex, you know, this right here, this last developing part of our brain that's like forehead and behind our eyes, that part of or that part, or, you know, above our eyes, that part of our brain is really not 
the, a part of that essential wiring that's the underpinning. We want to loop that in, but if we look at our attachment systems, that's not part of our our neocortex or our cortex. That's where we have all our thinking. That's a level under. That's our limbic system. It connects up to our cortex. It connects down to some of our lower regions, you know, in our brain. But our attachment systems are much more basic. So we know that that works to help kids. We'll talk about what to do with that. And then trauma and traumatic loss therapy. That helps. That way kids just aren't so scared. Now, I'm not going to talk about trauma, traumatic loss today. Someone else may be talking about this. Um, you know, maybe some other conference I'll come in and talk about it. But I have sat and written up books till I have to get physical therapy. I'm so curved around the computer on how to work with kids with traumatic loss. And, you know, Mike Berry and Kristen Berry have written books. So I'd invite you to look at some of the resources. But um, we're going to talk some about traumatic, or about secure attachments today. What we find is that over 20 years of research shows improvement and balance of the HPA axis after children form secure attachments. Isn't that cool? And so... Here we have this really complicated brain diagram with the hypothalamus, that's where you get the H, pituitary gland, that's the P, adrenal, A. It's a really complicated picture, but it's secure attachments that brings that system back into balance. Isn't that neat? And so we have an improvement then in executive functioning. The brain responds to the presence of a caring parent who helps that child to feel safe. And so let's move on to the next slide. So when we look at attachment patterns, one of the things you have in responsibilities is a responsibility to develop the type of attachment with your child that will help them to recover after high stress, trauma, and losses. Right. So what is sensitive parenting theory of mind towards child? Um, sense, and I'm going to talk, let me just define theory of mind towards a child. Sensitive parenting means parents are sensitive towards the needs of their children. Um, and that is it overlaps quality called theory of mind. And theory of mind is you just get what motivates your child. Um, I'll give you an example. Uh, when I had a teenager, my teenager was very musical, um, not very oriented towards school. And so one time on his birthday, he and I drove down to a store called Lark in the Morning. Lark in the Morning had a lot of instruments, really interesting, fun ones. And so one of the things that I did is buy him this for his birthday. That was meaningful for him. Looking at those instruments, that was meaningful to him. Okay, I got him. I didn't get him a new shirt. Didn't buy him new socks, new sneakers. I got something that was meaningful. Um, sense of parents get their kids and it's a lot harder to get our kids when sometimes they're so used to fending for themselves that they've got a lot of control up around themselves. I had a girl and her parents were in complaining about her because she was so controlling. I said, well, the flip side of control is anxiety. Um, check to see if your daughter isn't really afraid going into the classroom in the morning. And maybe that's the reason why she's so controlling. We checked in with her and she said she's scared of rejection every day. That's why she's so controlling about her clothing. Um, I had parents of teenagers who were complaining, saying, 
our son wants to make the basketball team. We've moved to a house where there's a playground right up the street. Kids are up there playing basketball all the time. He won't go up. You know, and yet he wants to make the basketball team. He's just so lazy. I said, well, just for the fun of it, why don't you check out going up there with him? Maybe he's kind of shy about going up there by himself. Didn't come into the family till 12 years of age. Never uh, been raised in a family from four till that age. I said, why don't you go up with him? And the dad said, I did go up with him. When he picked up the basketball, his hands were trembling. He was really shy about being accepted by that group. That's theory of mind, understanding your kids' sensitivities. So the bigger the defense, often the smaller the little person behind it. But let's talk from the positive end of it. So sensitive parenting means you have a theory of mind towards kids. You also value the relationship, not just the behavior. Yes, we want the kids to behave. But the most important thing is the relationship we're developing with the kids. Not can we get all these annoying habits down to the bare minimum by being on them all the time. But we value just being together some of the time. Parents, number two, they meet basic needs quickly. They don't frustrate their kids. Many of your kids have been through terrible things that have overwhelmed them completely, and they're highly sensitive to frustration. So we want to help them buffer frustration and really keep frustrations to um, what they can tolerate. You know, we've got to build frustration tolerance. We don't just kind of throw them in the pool, hope they swim. Number three, we fix things or repair the relationship quickly when we don't get it right. So we say sorry and we really mean it. And we model what empathy looks like. Let's go to the next slide. In theory of mind, we can predict what matters to kids and pivot accordingly. So, for example, we don't schedule tutoring over basketball or soccer practice. We notice when kids are frustrated and anxious and we help them. You know, we don't automatically run to the if then, when then, consequencing. Or if we're already there, we'll say, well, let's back up and reconsider that. Let's, you know, I didn't want you to react in that way, but we've, we need a redo here so we can figure this out and do it a little differently next time. To number 15, slide 15. Sensitive parenting, theory of mind. These are key factors in secure attachments between parents and children. And what we find is they predict less continuity in placement, fewer disruptions, fewer dis uh, dissolutions. Many of you are doing kinship parenting, that is, you've got foster parent guardianship or you know, um, you're in a, a parenting relationship where you're doing a lot of parenting at your near the aunt, and now you're the mom, or you were grandparents, and now you're parents. And, you know, this applies to any, when I talk about parenting, talking about anyone who's parenting kids. And we find if we take everyone who's parenting, whether it's kin, through kinship, foster care and adoption, you know, you're not the first parents, you're, you're, you're the next group. Um, maybe for some of the kids, you're the seventh group. But, you know, we find that if we have sensitive parents who are working on sensitivity, theory of mind, they're forming secure attachments, the rate of placement out of the home really drops. Another thing for you to know is a lot of times professionals think, well, you get through the first two years, you're good to go. The rate of dissolution, disruption in adoption and foster care it keeps climbing year after year. 12, 13, 14, those are peak areas for kids to come out of the home. And so you want to be looking at this preventatively. I really want to be working on these things because we don't want to be somebody else's 
cautionary tale, or we want don't want to look back and say, we should have worked a whole lot more on this than how to multiply fractions. Okay, uh, slide number 16. I don't mean to be grim about that, but how many of us are working on things with our kids that aren't going to make a lot of difference? You know, a $10 calculator or your phone can do some of this stuff. Yeah. So, and so other things about secure attachments. I mentioned before about they value the relationship. And some of the things about that sensitive parents do pretty routinely is they limit children's frustrations. You know, they they kind of think, my kid has about this much frustration tolerance. We're gradually going to see if we can widen that, that amount. But we're not going to take them to the limit because nobody wants to be stretched to the limit every single day. Maybe we'll go through the, the day the night before, either in pictures or just a description before, you know, sometime after dinner and say, this is what the next day holds. When's it going to be hard for you? When's it going to be easy? Do we need to drop something out? Do we need to shorten something? How can we help you with this, buddy? You know, notice there's kind of a kindness about that. So they feel like you're coming around them and supporting them. So they don't feel alone. Like, I hope I don't make a big mistake. I don't, I hope I don't have a blow up. I hope I don't hurt somebody. Hope I don't hit. It's like, oh, we'll get there with you and together we'll look at the day together. We also teach them how to apologize without excuses. And that's something that we can model. I make all kinds of excuses or all kinds of mistakes in a day. And um, uh, when I have kids in my therapy room and they're twins, I call them by the wrong name sometimes. Um, and the kids love it because if I call out their twin's name, I give them a dollar. So they're betting on me. I hope Deborah Gray makes that mistake. You know, I hope we get a dollar. Do you think she'll have a bad day and do it twice? We could get two bucks each, you know. So if they have, like, the name that starts with the same first initial, they, they see me start in, and, I'm, and they're like, go for it. Call out the wrong name. This is going to be cool. But I do this purposefully, not call out the wrong name, but, you know, that just comes naturally to me. But they're like, about, I want to model for them that weakness, how to make up restitution, you know, whatever. Or if I say to kids something and then mess it up a little bit, I say, oh, you get an extra treat out of the candy dish today. Sorry for messing up. Will that make it right? Yeah. They said, well, it might need two extra treats. I don't know. Well, okay. I can go with that. But be playful with them a little bit. Have some fun with the kids. You know, it's more fun that way. And then we understand children's feelings and values. I really want to know what are their feel what are they feeling? We don't ask kids enough about let's explore together and figure out what went wrong. I had a kid in my office yesterday who didn't go to school. And I said, Well, you know, you're just now leaving school to come see me, would it be that you didn't have something that you could say to the friends about why you were leaving early? You didn't know how to say you're going for counseling. He said, I don't mind sharing that with some of my best friends, but not just everybody. So I just decided not to go to school for the day. Okay. Now I've been working with kids for years, I kind of guessed that might be it. But I'd much rather work with that kid on how we can give him an excuse that flies than fight with him around, look at all that you missed for the day. And now we've got a compulsory education law on this state, and you've abided it. What's going to come of you someday in the future? You'll lose jobs. Now, how do you feel about the future if you're hearing this sermon? Pretty bad. 
not only did I miss the day and I have to face all the kids tomorrow, were you sick? Were you sick? Are you okay now? But I have to come up with another big fib next week. I mean, you can either go that way or try this as an excuse for kids. This has worked for other kids. See, one's supportive, one not, one's more challenged, and it just leads to despair. Let's move on. And then all of us, when we're feeling um, pressed as parents, when we're kind of scared, we're very likely to go to an alternate form of parenting that isn't so good. There's a difference between being authoritative, that is, I know about life, and I, I know a lot about how to raise kids well, and authoritarian. Authoritative parenting has been shown in research studies to really have good outcomes. Authoritarian, we have terrible outcomes. So authoritative parent, the parents stay emotionally balanced, call that regulated, authoritarian. The children and teens endure emotional parenting, very harsh consequences sometimes. I don't care about the why. I care about the results. That's authoritarian. Authoritative parents, the parents set and enforce rules and limits. They use consequences. Authoritarian. The parents matter most. Often, there's a sign in the kitchen, you know, if mommy ain't happy, nobody's happy. Okay, fear, and if you have one of those signs in the kitchen, you can still be a sensitive parenting, but you might want to kind of think, why is it somebody gave me that sign? Could I be tilted a little far in one direction? Fear, shame, frustration are really high in kids. They tend to be shame-based you're based, you know, it, it, it's not like you're bad people, but the kids are like, watch out, don't tell my mom. And if they're really in trouble, they're slow to come tell you. So then it's hard to be sensitive. You might say, well, why didn't you come to me? Well, since you seem to be more interested in behavior and consequences and shaming me than helping me, I didn't know you were available for help. Authoritative parents, the parents are encouraging mastery. If, you know, there's a lot of, you can do it, buddy. Let's find what you're good at. We're going to spend a lot of time on that. Parents develop children's, de value the children's developing personalities. They see the shape that the child could go, you know, and they help shape, you know, there, there's a bent that a particular child has. And, Parents are encouraging that. This seems to be who you are. Let's help you out with it. Teens of authoritarian parents will say, performance is all they care about. They don't really know me. They really don't care about me. Next slide. Authoritarian parenting were uh, come by teen years. It's especially hard on kids with trauma, grief, and loss. And what we find is this is the type of parenting least likely to move kids into a balanced HPA axis. We see them pretty much unchanged. The teens act out, get depressed, find someone else's voice to boss them some of the time. But in slide 19, in secure attachments, the parents have steadier moods. Next slide. In secure attachments, the parents have steadier moods. The thing is with secure attachments, it's marked by parents who have their own moods that are very regulated. They model the ability to handle stress, stress regulation. And they actually, we can, we can look at their brain scans and see a neurology. They're steady in their own mood regulation. The kids borrow stress regulation, that is the balance for stress, from their, birth, from their parents. And they develop brain patterns of stress regulation. You don't have to be related biologically to your child to shape their DNA in 
the expression of their DNA or to shape their brain development. We find that in this very intimate brain-to-brain -brain connection, we start downloading a stress regulation pattern into the developing brain. It's not 100% that in many kids then we find this, that they, that if the children get close to you, open up to you, then they have a neural firing pattern that is a brain cell firing pattern that starts to fire in response to yours. And we literally start downloading our develop our brain patterns into the developing brain. The earlier they get into your family, the better. But it still is occurring in later years. Isn't that the coolest thing? And so there's, that's where we're going to be putting our big money, our big efforts. So go to the next slide and I'll show you kind of another brain picture. This is Bruce Perry's. By the way, that, um, you know, 40 of us working together on that five-year project, Bruce Perry was part of that project. And he's our international expert in brains after trauma. He's just a fabulous person to brought us along so far. He's got a lot of information on um, his website. You could do Bruce Perry. Go look at his website if you want more in information on brains and trauma in kids. But if you look at the cortex here, that's our thinking part of the brain. You know, many, you know, that's where a lot of us are, you know, think before you leap. You know, we're, we're giving a lot of our lessons. Our limbic system is the next brain area underneath that. And that limbic system is what governs um, eating. Um, it, it starts to break down social and emotional relationships. That's where our attachment system is. And it's a very basic system. It's not so much about, see, I told you I loved you. Our love is forever. That's very wordy. That's that next system up. And that's nice to hear is why you're at the end. But a lot of this limbic system is how you are in relationship with the other person. You sit down and enjoy each other. Do you enjoy each other over meals? You know, are you that comfortable person to sit with? Are you playful? Do you have fun together? Do you smile a lot? You know, what are, what are your vo vo voice tones like? What's your eye contact look like? Are you welcoming? That's where a lot of our information is transmitted about how we feel about attachment. Does that make sense? And so for and we'll talk more next slide about how to do more about that. And this slide is in a brain-to-brain -brain connection. Parents lie, lend their balance to their children. Now, this little girl has an interesting thing that she's doing. She's just kind of taking a break, leaning into her dad with her eyes closed. She's not hyper alert out there taking care of herself in the world. He's got a smile and it's like, my child can depend on me. I'm kind of a safe place to lean into. They've taken this picture in some kind of a school situation, which is, you know, schools are stressful to kids. And she's like, got that I am loved, I'm valued feeling, he's got me. And that's what we want to be given to the kids. You know, it's a soft place to fall. So the next slide. So are you a source of regulation or dysregulation? And when, you're, when you're running, and all of us feel this way sometimes. I was talking to a, a friend of mine, Brandon, and, you know, they're, trying to regulate their baby. The baby's up at night and he's not getting a whole lot of sleep and the baby doesn't want to sleep at night. Baby wants to stay up all night and feed. 
And I said, I had one of those. There were a lot of tears. And a lot of those weren't from the baby. You know, they were coming from me. You know, it, it, it was tough. And so sometimes, you know, we have to look at our own stress level. What are we trying to do? What's stressful for us? So next slide. When we've got high cortisol levels, then it's really hard to be that sensitive parenting. You heard me mention a, a major researcher, Bill Fisher's group with the Oregon Social Learning Project. They did an interesting thing where they went into families when the parents were very high stress. They took kids' saliva tests. They also took parents. When they had really high stress parents, what they found is the parents were running high cortisol. And if they could have somebody just talk to the parents and be available, partner with the parents and bring parent stress level down. What we found is even if they didn't intervene with the kids, the kids' stress level went down. And when the kids' cortisol level went down, Cortis, high cortisol means that kids are often misbehaving more. The behavior problems came down. So sometimes when your cortisol levels are high, the thing you want to do is import somebody to balance you. So when kids are giving nonverbal, verbal signals of high stress, loss, and trouble, trauma, we often take this on in our own bodies. We can start the day kind of relaxed and happy by 11 o'clock, you know, our shoulders are up to our chin, we're high stress, and the parents are going to pick up on that. So we have to do something on a body-based level because we're going to feel this responsibility, do something, you know. First thing you want to do is do something for yourself. And then I want to just make a side note here. If you have always been the person who expected your spouse to regulate you and vice versa, and this is like a really normal thing in relationships, is our, we basically depend on each other to co-regulate each other. You know, it's uh, one of the things we look at with successful couples. But if your spouse or your partner is running just as high stress as you, that's not going to work as well. You get together and it's like the thrill is gone. You know, they're just as stressed as I am. They're deep. I, I thought I was stressed before. Then they tried to load a little bit more on me. This isn't working. I had a woman who came in and she said, you know, Deborah, no offense, but I don't recall half of what you say after you leave. But I feel like I've had a massage because you bring my stress down and you support me. And we've actually done, uh, years ago, uh, Dozier and Bates did a little exercise when they looked at brain scans of therapists who had secure attachment capacities in their clients. We find is therapists reach out bring dysregulated people into their own, into their regulation, and then those people kind of hold on to that regulated brain pattern when they leave. They, they work on things and kind of move into a working mode, but they lend regulation. And it's not just therapists who do this. Good friends do this. Support groups do this. People who care about you do this. Not the people who are like, well, every child does this. Or my child did this too. Maybe the child had like the perfect prenatal existence, you know. Maybe the kid occasionally acted out. And you leave there and you think frequency and duration frequency and duration. Maybe your kid did this once a day for 10 minutes. My kid does this most of the day. And my kid does it often. My kid does this frequently and it lasts a long time. Have you ever been through a two-hour temper tantrum with a nine-year-old? 
No, your temper tantrum lasted 10 minutes. Don't even tell me, and now I feel misunderstood. Find people who really get you, whether it's a therapist yourself. My poor therapist, when I call her up, do a telemedicine with her, she doesn't get a word in edgewise. It's like I paid good money for this attention. So she can hardly use her skills. She just has to listen for things. Anyway, as I said, I paid good money for the listening ear. But if, whether you buy it with a therapist, whether you get this regulated mind through somebody at church, or you go pray with your pastor, you know, you're looking, how can I get more regulation? And don't do something like move into authoritarian parenting. It'll, you'll shoot yourself in the foot. Okay. And don't change something that's a current support. Try not to change up your spouse. Okay, um, move to the next slide, because that may not do the trick for you. You know, because that kind of do something, sometimes, you know, we'll, we'll make a, a move that's not a good idea when we're under high stress. So when I say don't change up your spouse, I mean, don't try to, uh, think, well, I would be better off getting a divorce than at least this kid would only be with me part of the day or part of the week. I get a break. And I do have parents who think about this. Okay, so what, when we find that, I've already kind of covered this, so let's go to the next slide. So I'm going to give you some things that are just short things that you can do if you're under stress can do this for yourself, can also do this for your kids. Number one, this is from TIPS, and this is Marsha Linehan. Temperature control, temperature manipulation. Take a warm bath, cool shower, have a cold drink, go have a half drink, a hot drink. Go take five minutes in a sauna or go stand on the front porch. A lot of times that'll break that mood really quickly. Do not take your kid and put them in a cold shower, by the way, if you think, oh, that's the way to, um, you know, control their temperature. You're going to end up hurting somebody getting the kid in the shower. You take the cold shower. You know, some people get a cup of ice and just put a nice cube in their, their um, mouth. Notice we're not talking about helpful thoughts. We're just like, how do we get our mood changed? You know, if you can think help, you can think of helpful thoughts later. Just in the here and now, these are things that will regulate you really quickly. Go throw cold water on your face. You know, those are things. Or put a warm compress on your face. Temperature manipulation will help you. I, intense exercise, heart rate up to 70% of your maximum rate. Hold it for 20 minutes. For me, even if I run in place for two to five minutes in my office, it'll help. I did this with a kid with telemedicine the other day. You know, we just ran in place really fast. She's 16. She was laughing and looking at me as I looked at her. She could see herself on the screen because actually she's recovering from COVID. Her family has it. You know, but that intense exercise will start to clear that mood state. You know, I tried an exercise with a really fast walk an hour a day with my dog. And I'll climb down like a steep hill to the lake and then back up again, you know, because it gets my heart rate up. But then after you get rid of that, you know, all that tension in your body, you're, you'll re-regulate. The nice thing about it, too, is it's good for your body and you'll have a rush of endorphins after. Endorphins are those feel-good hormones, and it will really help you out to stay in a better mood. Um, I got a dog on purpose when my last one passed so that that dog needs exercise every single day because that gets me out walking that dog. And um, then taste breathing. We're going to do this together. You've heard square breathing. I've taught that. Square breathing is great, but if you're really dysregulated, try this one instead. And we're going to 
Breathe out to the count of seven, into the count of five. So out. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You can do this for 10 minutes. It'll shift your mood, move you from, um, we'll go to the next slide and I'll explain what it's doing. What it'll do is the breathing in activates your sympathetic nervous system. It increases arousal. The breathing out activates your parasympathetic nervous system and it decreases arousal and it calms you okay and then peer and breathing in breathing out really activates the right parts of your brain you ever notice a lot of people say take a deep breath and your kids will say it doesn't work it doesn't you have to go the opposite way you have to use the physiology of the brain correctly and then I'll teach you paired muscle relaxation. I kind of kind of blitz so that I could finish the initials, but it was kind of helpful to understand that breathing. And then the P, paired muscle relaxation, tension release. So think robot noodle. So everybody, tighten, 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 tighten all your muscles. Kristen. You're not tightening all your muscles. Tighten all your muscles. Come on, Mike. Tighten all your muscles. Tighten, 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 tighten. All your face, all your limbs, feet, everything tight, 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 release. How'd that feel? And that's working with the stress systems. And what that'll do is it'll reset. That's what we want to do. You can do this yourself. Do it for your kids. And that is it where you're trying to say to yourself, let me memorize this Bible verse and say it. Now, you can say that after you do these things, but work with the body and then go up to the brain. Okay? Because then everything works in better thinking. You know, I like to think some, about things that are true, beautiful, lovely, worthy of good report, just all those things, worthy of praise. But if I work with my body first, then I can do the cognitive stuff. Remember that Bruce Perry diagram, working with lower systems than going up. Okay, that'll work better. Okay, next slide, and then we're going to finish up here in a couple minutes. And then, I've mentioned this before, but get someone to regulate you. Have a support group that's a healthy one, not a, oh, I tried that and it didn't work for me, or, yeah, my kid seemed to be getting better, and then he ended up getting far, you know, some of the groups, all the people with positive results left. And all the people with negative results are still hanging out. Get a support group that's balanced. Get an encourager, like a friend who can just call and encourage you sometime. I have friends who save jokes for me, and I suggest that for other people. Can you be on my team? Just encourage me. Can you look for the best of my family? Or I have a friend um, I said, you know, can I pray for one of your kids? Or for, pray for your kids. She said, I have too many. But you could take this one. And that'll help. You know, and, and I encourage her and say, you know, I'm praying for your child. You know, tell me some, how it's going. You know, and that's part of my job. It, and I have conversations with God. Asking for wisdom. Ultimate acceptance. I've used this for the kids I'm working with. 
Lord, give me wisdom for this child. Help me to accept this child radically where they are right now. I know they need to change. But they need to experience my love and acceptance. Okay. In respite care, get a break. Sometimes we need a break just to kind of count our marbles, get ourselves reset, not listening what's happening in the house right now. You know, get a break for yourselves if you can. Next slide. So we're looking at what's really necessary in raising kids. Legal force of, form of income, educational route. Um, oops, slide left, but um, I'll find it on my slides and just read it. And an education route that supports this. Get assessments. Find out what your child's strengths and difficulties are. You know, if you have, if we take kids who have been through our foster care system, you know, our educational, uh, their educational assist achievement really comes up with assessments and with some special uh, ed help. You know, don't fool around with that. Get a neuropsych if you can. Uh, slide number two, get health and mental health help for the kids. Preventative counseling for trauma, loss, adoption, or foster care issues. These are not wait and see kids. You want to get in early. You know, all kids who have been through trauma are going to need some specialized help. We see hands down uh, better improvement or much better improvement in kids who get trauma work with a trauma specialist, someone who's really good at trauma. Have meaning, work on meaningful relationships for your kids. You know, I really want to spend a lot of time helping them have friends. Get them into social skills groups where they can learn how to make friends. Mastery. What are they good at? You're going to spend a lot of time on what are they good at and, and, and capitalize on that. If they're strong here, what's that look like? Positive ethnic identity. You know, many of you are raising kids who are part of uh, a minority subculture, and they need a lot of time with other minorities. You know, make sure that they're around people just naturally who look that, like them, who can get, be positive role models for them so that they feel part of that community. And let's go to the next slide. So, Many of these building blocks that I've just mentioned, we're going to be able to break down. And by the way, I just gave you resiliency characteristics that are all research-based. So let's look at John, um, age 15. He's got an IP that allows him to succeed at school. The parents make a list. What's he going to need? Income. So at 15, we ask an uncle to teach him about money. We get John into high school, a high school with a community college program that starts in high school for automotive repair. We revise this IEP. Next slide. Parent responsibility, mental health treatment. Get some check-in sessions with me around earlier sexual abuse, the parents' budget, time, and energy, contact adoption support. Number three, relationships. John tries out three interest clubs. He finds a group. They get the school counselor to do the group. John gets enrolled in social skills at school. He finds two kids there, friends there. John's out of place at church. The parents find a youth group that has cute girls, less teaching, that has less sophisticated verbal information as part of his youth group. More fun, more relationship. John starts going there. Mastery. Dad and John look for a car to repair and restore. They haul one home and work on it every weekend. So by 16, John has a working vehicle, bragging rights, keeps his grades up. He's off drugs to get and retain a license. And he tries to make sure that, so we want to try to make sure that, next slide then, I'm on to the next slide. There we go. And by 
And so we try to make sure that the kids have something that they want that pushes for pro-social behavior. John doesn't go on drugs because he'd lose his license, you know, and he really wants to be able to drive and he's really interested in automotive repair and that this job that he's got and all the kids are interested in his car that is remodeling. So let's look at the cost benefit ratio to parents. That's the next page. And so here's the category. The category income and money, the cost of parents to benefits for. Categories, friends, relationships, cost of parent a two and Benefits of five because, and, and let's break that down. I'm using John as an example uh, with the income and money, the cost for the, the you know, it, for the school, they had to redo the IP. So it took some time and attention, pretty good benefit. For instance, relationship, again, revision with the IP, research, different youth group, get them into social skills. That's a five. We're doing one out of five. School, keeping track of, you know, entrance into the high school to community college. Again, time and attention on the parents, it's a two. School's initially done it, doing it, it's a five. Mental health, they've got to drive up to see me, put some money into it. That's a three. Benefits, five. Mastery, and the mastery is working on that car at home. That's a four. Parents had to spend seven hundred dollars for a junker, but the benefit to five. Okay, so you've got lots of options for things for kids and you to do. That's the next slide. Pick out things that are high value, lowest cost. Not a lot of four and fives, and the costs are in a family budget. Time, energy, attention, money. So I like to work out a grid, and it helps you to fulfill responsibility for major success factors. And then I've got, these are the last slides, I'm starting to run late. Think of four R's, this is slide number five. You've got rewards, or, or use money, next slide, or items, you're gonna reward in small quantities, including praise. And lots of rewards, lots of frequency. The ADHD brain is heavily reward oriented. You can just freeze rewards until they do restitution. But I have kids rewarded regularly, randomly, trying to work on any behavior. Use screens, tap, any screens. You can use that time as rewards. You can reward kids and freeze their assets Till they come up. I keep rewarding them for positives. They just can't use rewards. And this helps them remember things. The ADHD brain and the executive brain do best remembering things that are meaningful and rewarding. Practice what you want them to do. These are redos. Next slide. Don't keep telling them. After all, who's got the auditory memory issue? Try again what you wish they'd done through a role play praise success, and some kids don't accept praise. Label the issue, say you're an honest person, you're letting me go, you don't think the praise fits. Maybe I see something you don't. I'll leave the reward here. You can take it to keep or give away. You've made your point. Repair, said this already, teach kids to say sorry and restitution. Give them little jobs, that's the next slide, like dusting baseboards, helping bigger jobs, helping with rockeries, and then give praise for the whole family for the help it is that they've done for the family. And say so next time, maybe I'll pay for the work that you did, but you did restitution. And this is the last slide. Past infancy, it helps the most in forming secure attachments and executive functioning. And so, um, actually, I lied. There's one more slide. We're wired for the most connection for play, where our brain, all the parts are working, developing the most. The brain has the most connectivity, which aids executive development during play. During highly active free play, we'll see the brain fire up the most. 
So your final parental responsibility is play with your kids. And that's it. Now I have extra credit because I'm, I'm a gunner. So a lot of the things that I talked about, uh, I had extra slides for, and I imagine that um, Kristen and Mike can put the slides up for you later. Sorry, I'm running a little bit late here for today. But, okay. you know, I'll just conclude this with my best, and I'll talk to you later in the day. Enjoy your day. Thank you for listening to the Honestly Adoption Podcast, a resource courtesy of the Honestly Adoption Company. To learn more about us, visit www.honestlyadoption.com.